So here we are, fresh off of Curse of Sand. The Earth has the Hyuga Clan, Wind has the Sand Village, Lightning has frogs, and Water is there too. This leaves Bondi with a very interesting problem. Fire is still undoubtedly the best set in the game, but as you can probably guess, by this point it's getting stale. Set 1 Fire just put Fire in too good of a position right from the get-go, and every set that's come after it has really just given Fire some new tools to work with. Heck, Set 2 saw Fire's counter in the form of Mental Power, and what did Fire do? They just made Fire Mental Decks. 8 Trigram and Charangun Eye are an incredibly good jutsu lineup. Set 1. The third Hokage is still one of the best boss monsters in the game. He has the highest support of any ninja you'll find, and he heals your dudes every single turn. Set 1. If your opponent thought they could do something clever to stop you last turn, Exhaustion of Stamina, GG, you're done. Set 1. So how do you even release fire support? You can't release something weaker than what we already have because nobody's gonna play it. You can't release something too powerful or else an already strong element is going to end up completely overshadowing every other element in the game. But you do have to release SOMETHING good for it, because it needs to start advancing just like the other elements have. This innocent mindset would be the foundation for Bandai Namco releasing one of the most hilariously broken sets in card gaming history. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is Revenge and Rebirth. Let's start with something pretty basic. Beyond the Limit Sasuke was released, who can use one jutsu card called Chidori for free. There was a ruling made around this time that if a character had an optional effect like this, the optional effect could only be used once per turn. So once per turn, you can use one free Chidori. Seems like a pretty good card. I mean, it's turn one instead of turn zero like the regular Sasuke card, so it couldn't be that bad, could it? It couldn't be the most powerful jutsu card released in the entire set, could it? Ah. So I'm going to read you what this card does, and I want you to keep in the back of your mind the entire time that this little emo kid can do it for free. Chidori. The user gets plus five, plus zero. Wow, we are off to a great start. So this turn one character, who is a three zero, can now become an eight zero for free on turn one. Just to put this into perspective, the most powerful ninja in the entire game is Gamma Bunta, who is a turn 5 with a ridiculously specific summoning cost, and he can only be sent out in battle in a deck that revolves solely around him. Before Gamma Bunta, the strongest ninja we have is Jiraiya, who is a 7-2, and he can only be summoned on turn 6. Alright, so 5 power, gets a kunai and a cross-shaped shuriken for free. If this ninja's team wins a victory or an outstanding victory, give one additional damage to each ninja battling against this ninja when damage is applied. <laughs> oh. So in layman's terms, if you win a regular victory, then even though Sasuke is an 8-0, you apply the damage as though Sasuke is secretly a 13-0, which is the equivalent of two cross-shaped shurikens and two kunai. And if you win an outstanding victory, then you apply the damage as though you have Zabuza's effect, and just discard every ninja battling against you. Yeah, this seems like a reasonable thing that a turn one should have. <clears throat> For free? As you can imagine, this made Chidori a pretty difficult thing to get a hold of. Confusingly, if you couldn't get your hands on Chidori and the other Sasuke, they released another Sasuke that's almost as good. Reason for the late arrival was sort of a budget option Sasuke that, uh, was actually pretty darn good. He's a turn 1-4 combat ninja that gets plus 1 entrance cost in your hand as long as neither player has a battle reward. The trick is to run him in congruence with Sasuke analysis of competence. If your opponent attacks and gets a battle reward, the next turn you can just growth into the new Sasuke. Once you've growthed in, this Sasuke is a turn 1-5 combat ninja. Yep, 5 whole combat. You know, like a turn 4 ninja. You may be saying right now, okay, I get it, Kudo. This Sasuke guy does sound like a pretty bad boy, but I wouldn't really say that that makes an entire set super busted or anything. Oh, so you want something more broken. Is that what you want? You want something more broken? Is that what you're waiting for? Well, allow me 
to oblige APW Third Hokage, one of the most legendary cards in all of Naruto's CCG history, all the way up to the end of the game. Some of you who joined the game a bit later might actually recognize that the Third Hokage's effect looks a little bit different here. See, they made it a little more tolerable in the newer sets, but when APW first came out, let me assure you, he was the best thing that the game has seen. Bar none. Bar none. You cannot argue that anything in the game was as powerful as the third Hokage APW. His effect is during the exchange of jutsu, you can send one ninja battling against him back to the deck, and then he kills himself at the end of the turn. This makes APW Third Hokage the most powerful answer to literally everything in the game. Your opponent's beating you in power? Not a problem. Are ninja effects getting you down? Don't feel like going into mental power battles? What, Suzume? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh no, not Sasuke! I sure hope he doesn't have a Chidori in his hand. Oh no, he does! Gee willikers, I sure am in a bind! You can probably see why APW was such a problematic card. Even if you find a way to get over APW and put me in a position where I might lose, then I'll just declare APW's effect and blow up whatever's causing the problem. This card earned the nickname Brokage, due to how broken its effect was. Though personally, I like to call it the Nope Kage, because if your opponent did anything, you said Nope, and then you threw them off of the field. You may look at the fact that it destroys itself at the end of the turn after using this effect as a downside, but secretly that's actually not too bad, because once he destroys himself with this effect, you can just play another one next turn, and then you get another Nope. The entire meta would end up being built around this card and Sasuke and Chidori. Okay, so we've got extremely powerful ninjas and a jutsu card, so where could we go from here? Right, missions. A ranked mission. Attach this permanent mission card to one of your ninjas, and if that ninja wins a victory or an outstanding victory, you win one battle reward. Oh good. Oh wonderful. So now Kakashi's battle reward boosting effect can either double, or you can just give it to literally anybody. Keep in mind, permanents don't have some kind of limit so you could literally just have three A-ranked missions in play and just boost the crap out of your opponent by winning three battle rewards every turn. The only thing that made this card slightly bearable is the fact that it was a turn four mission card, and most mission cards were played pretty early on to gather chakra. You could still feasibly play two to three of these in the deck though, and if you did, then it would end up turning your opponent's situations into much, much worse situations. Because if they don't block, you get an outstanding battle reward, so you get two battle rewards. If they do block with anything that cannot defeat their team, then you get three battle rewards, because you can have one A-ranked mission on each of your ninjas in the team. And if one of those ninjas just happens to be a Kakashi, then you get four battle rewards. Keep in mind that you win the game at ten battle rewards. Well, at least fire decks aren't wildly consistent. <gasps> Oh, wait a minute! The one who inherits and entrusts the will. If all of your ninjas are leaf ninjas, which, I want to remind you guys, both the Brokage and Sasuke are leaf ninjas, then you can draw until you have six cards in your hand. So, <laughs> uh, okay. You charge your entire hand to the chakra area, and then you play one who inherits and entrusts the will, you charge the last card in your hand, and you plus six. Good. Good. Can't see a single problem here. At this point, I feel the need to emphasize the fact that, even though it sounds like I'm beating the same drum over again with fire being the best element, it's never been quite this apparent. The standings so far have looked something like this. Yeah, fire's obviously there at the top, and there are some elements down at the bottom, but... It's so far been pretty close. You know, and then Revenge and Rebirth came out. But I also don't want to sit here and blame fire for the huge power spike that came in Revenge and Rebirth, because honestly, all of the elements got something pretty cool. One of my personal favorite cards in the game is Naruto Uzumaki, Control of Power. 
And yes, that does mean that his shortened name is Naruto Cop, and yes, his presence does in fact police the field. During the exchange of Jutsu, you can choose to discard the top two cards for your deck to give him a plus one power boost. The cool thing about this ability is you can use it up to three times in the same exchange of Jutsu phase, meaning that Naruto is potentially a 3-0-6-0 if you played him correctly. If you've watched the previous videos, you'll remember that I said deck sizes are 40 cards. So, if you use this ability three times in the same exchange of Jutsu phase, you're giving up six of the cards in your deck. Meaning that with that and the cards that you drew, you're already over a quarter of the way through your deck. Some people will see this as a huge disadvantage, and it is, but the thing that makes Cop Naruto so powerful isn't necessarily the effect itself, it's the threat of the effect. If I attack that Naruto, is he willing to give up the six cards to beat me and injure my ninja? A lot of players predicated how good you were as a player to how you used a cop Naruto. Honestly though, it's pretty simple. First of all, you'll notice that this Naruto has growth, so you'll want to growth this ninja as soon as possible so that you get the plus one boost without having to give up cards from your deck. Secondly, it's pretty obvious if you've ever played the game before what you're supposed to do with this card. You're supposed to tie. If your opponent's coming at you with 2 power, and you block with this ninja, and you go up to 3 power, I mean, I really hate to say it, but that's a really horrible move, and it kind of shows that you're not that experienced in the game yet. You go up to 2 power, so that you injure their ninja, and you go into injured status, giving you a plus 3 power boost permanently. Sure, he can only take one more hit after that, but if he's not injured, and he's just a 0-0, there's a pretty good chance your opponent's just going to steamroll him and deal 2 damage immediately, so you might as well just give him the power boost as early as possible so that he can be as useful as possible. A potential 6-0 is nothing to sneeze at, and if he's growth, he's a potential 7-1, which I would like to remind you all is Jiraiya levels of power on a level 0. Another thing that made Naruto Cop so interesting is he provided something to the game that you don't see in very many card games. If you're somebody who doesn't play card games competitively, uh, let me explain something to you. Information is one of the most interesting and intricate parts of any card game. I know all of us have played at some kind of local tournament where uh, we've had that really annoying, overbearing opponent who will, like, pick up our discard pile and squirt through it every few turns. And trust me, I know how annoying that guy is, but on the other hand, there is a reason that they're doing it. Card game players as a whole tend to follow certain trends. So if you can pay attention to what tools your opponent does not have access to, it's a lot easier to gauge what they do have access to. When you pumped Naruto for his effect, you weren't just getting the power boost, and you weren't just losing cards from your deck. You were also revealing two cards to your opponent that you will not have access to for the rest of the game, in most cases anyway. So if you flipped up a Chidori, for example, your opponent would know that they would be up one Chidori on you and could win Chidori tools. So they could easily use one Chidori to knock out your Chidori and still have two left over, which will be more than what you have. If you charged a Brokage for Chakra, and then you flip a Brokage for Naruto's effect, well, typically decks only run two Brokage. So both of your Brokage are gone. Your opponent knows that and your opponent will play around it effectively. This brings up a few more interesting things about the set, but we'll get into that a bit later. For right now, just understand that Naruto was a very important staple in everybody's deck at 3 of, no less. I know I've talked about this before, but Shikamaru was an interesting character in the card game, because every time a Shikamaru released starting in this set, it became an important staple that was just in everybody's decks. Everybody ran Shikamaru regardless of what kind of deck you had, or what you felt about the character. He was just as important as Naruto and Sasuke were for your level 0 or level 1 lineup. His effect is pretty simple. When he's out to battle and opposed, you can discard two cards from your hands, and if you did, this ninja's team and the opposing team perform a mental power battle. I would just like to direct your attention to Shikamaru's mental power. Uh, it's frickin' four! There wasn't a single ninja released in the entire game who could match Shikamaru's mental power, so he was essentially just an automatic win button for just discarding two cards from your hand. Which is a pretty balanced and useful effect, you know, it's not like, it, it's not like, it's not like Fire had any cards that would just refill their entire hand instantly or anything, that would be ridiculous. 
every deck had to run Shikamaru, because even if you weren't going to use his effect, you needed his 4 mental power to block against your opponent's Shikamarus, and you needed it to be, again, a threat that your opponent would have to think about if they ever attacked into you. Tamari AM is arguably the best level 1 drop that you can get in your deck, because she gets mental power put into her support stat when she's in battle and opposed. This means that she sets a new precedent. She is the only level 1 in the game that gives 3 support, and that's huge because that means you can step over any opponent who's not running Tamari in their lineup. That one mental power is also important if you're running a deck with Shikamaru, because if you have Shikamaru and Tamari together, that's five mental power, baby. That means you can win an outstanding victory anytime you activate Shikamaru's effect. There's one more card in the set that's vital to talking about how this set defines the meta in Caged Bird. Caged Bird is a counter mission that allows you to make one ninja unable to go out to battle. If you don't fully understand why stopping one ninja from going out to battle is meta-defining, I'll explain. Because of the way Naruto works, if one ninja on your team cannot go out to battle, every ninja in that ninja's team also cannot go out to battle. So if your opponent had a team of three ninjas out, you just tagged one ninja in it as not being able to go out to battle, and then you can just attack full force because your opponent cannot block with any ninja in that ninja's team. You'll also notice this is a counter permanent, so you can't play it on your turn, you have to play it during your opponent's turn. But, if you tag one of their ninjas, that would normally be really useful to them, then they can no longer start including that ninja in teams with other ninjas because it would just hinder their entire game. So as soon as you tagged someone, they had to play the game as though that ninja just doesn't exist. And since your opponent controls this card, it being a counter permanent after all, your opponent is the one whose turns have to pass in order for this card to expire, so they are essentially out their best card for two turns. As you can probably imagine, it's, uh, it's pretty annoying. Talking about the different kinds of decks that were out at this point would be pretty pointless. Everybody in competitive play ran some version of THE deck. Those of you that played around the time probably know this deck by heart just like I do, so feel free to sound it off and get nostalgic with me. 3 Cop Naruto's, 2 Shika 200's, 2 Promo Sakura's, 3 Fridori Sasuke's, 2 AM Tamari's, 2 Protection Neji's, 1 Suzume, 1 Kabuto that gets rid of permanence, 2 Ibiki's, 1 Hayate detecting a plan, 2 of Ino's dad, 2 Kakashi, 2 Brokage, 3 Chidori, 2 Sharingan Eye, 2 Headhunter Jutsu, 3 Caged Bird, 2 Exhaustion of Stamina, 1 End of the Mortal Kombat, 1 Inherits the Will, 1 of that one guy who is both fire and earth and gives you damage if you get 3 battle rewards. This is essentially what competitive Naruto looked like during set 4, but getting back to Naruto for a second. The genius of Naruto is if you played too closely to this established formula, he would actually end up outing your deck because your opponent would be able to predict what your deck would still have in it. So one of the challenges of the metagame was to somehow play at the tip-toppiest of tiers but still be different enough that your opponent couldn't just immediately guess what was in your deck with Naruto. I understand that a lot of people hated playing this metagame because of how stale it seemed, but to be honest, with everybody having decks that were pretty similar to this, and with everything being an answer to somebody else in the game, it was actually a really fun metagame to watch. In fact, something that old Naruto players will tell you is if you really want to see how good somebody is at the game, or watch somebody progress in getting better at the game itself, then give two people an R&R set and see how they build a deck and see how they play against each other. You may not like this metagame, but one thing that nobody can argue against is you have to be extremely skilled in this metagame to survive. In metagames with a diverse number of decks, you can usually count on something. Either your jutsus are going to be better than the opponents, or there's some gimmick that's going to save you if you happen to make a mistake. But in this particular metagame, since everybody is relying on essentially the same control cards, you have to just be better than the other person and be slightly luckier in order to win. There's no gimmick that's going to save you, and if there is a gimmick that's going to save you, your opponent probably has it too. You're going to see some older cards here, and you're also going to see some cards that we haven't talked about yet, so let's go over what the structure of the deck is, and then we'll get on to some different cards. Naruto's obvious, too powerful not to run. 
Sheikah, again, if your opponent doesn't have mental power, he can just be like an automatic win. Sakura is an interesting one because we haven't really covered this yet. See, in the Naruto card game, there was a promo that was released starting, I think, in set 3, where you could send off 12 opened booster packs to the company, and they would send you three promo cards back. It was an ingenious way for kids to get their moms and dads to buy them even more booster packs because they could send those booster packs in and get three free promo cards. If you wanted a full playset of them all, you better get your hands on 26 open booster packs. All three of the promo cards were pretty good, but honestly, Soccer is the only one who saw extended play. Her effect is pretty simple. You could injure her during the exchange of jutsu to turn a battle into a mental power battle, and she has three mental power, which is almost as good as Shikamaru. It just doesn't cost any hand advantage, and you can only do it once. Another promo that was really good was Naruto One Last Attack, and ah, I mean, obviously this is a really good Naruto, and a lot of people did stick with it for a brief period, but once Control of Power came out, it was really just not a contest. Control of Power was just better. If this ninja attacks and your opponent blocks, then you can give one damage to one of your opponent's ninjas at the end of the battle. Again, very good effect, but it also meant you couldn't really block with it, because if you blocked with it, you were losing out on its effect. Not being able to block with a ninja is kind of a big deal. Sasuke, obviously, but again, reason for the late arrival was also an acceptable substitute. Temtem for that 3 power. Suzume to block anybody who wasn't using mental power at this point. Neji was an interesting case. There were two Nejis flying around at this point. We had another method for absolute protection, which is this one, and then an older Neji that we'll talk about in a second. This was generally the more popular of the two because it had more use cases outside of just combating the meta. If this is battling against your opponent's team with only turn two and less ninjas, then he doesn't receive any damage. This made him pretty powerful in the metagame, because that meant if Fridori Sasuke came and tried to Chidori through him, it dealt no damage. If your opponent was trying to do mental power battles with Suzume or Shikamaru or Sakura, even if they win, it's still zero damage. Honestly, he was a really, really great use of a card, especially at this point in the game, because this would let you stall out until you were able to get to turns five or six, where the big guys would come out. Attack on Chakra Point was also seeing a bit of play. The head ninja battling against you can't use Jutsu, which was pretty useful for Sasuke as you can imagine, but also made him pretty useful for later in the game. Let's not forget that other than Chidori, there were other Jutsus in the game, and there was also somebody else using Chidoris in the name of Kakashi, so this was a pretty good counter to your opponent spamming Jutsu. Not nearly as popular as the new Neji, but he was still pretty useful nonetheless. Withdrawal Kabuto played an important role in this metagame because caged birds were everywhere. Kabuto was a one-turn answer to caged bird, and he could even block an attack if you really needed him to because his combat stats don't change and his effect is valid. So you put him in a team, and when your opponent drops that caged bird, you declare Kabuto's effect, and no more caged bird. Hypothetically, you could also use it to get rid of A-ranked mission or to get rid of um, Appearance of Unknown Rivals, but Caged Bird was the important thing. Ibiki, of course, an easy way to just go into mental power battles. Him and Shikamaru would be a mental power battle of five, so you just attack with that team. And if your opponent doesn't have mental power, then you just outstanding victory them, or you get a bunch of battle rewards. Hayate detecting a plan, again, it was a great way to foil your opponent's mission cards. This couldn't get rid of Caged Bird, obviously, because it has to be during your opponent's turn, so you could use this to stop your opponent from playing something else, like an Exhaustion of Stamina or uh, a One Who Inherits the Will, and then because he stays in play afterwards, you can use him to just chump block against one of your opponent's attacks, and that makes him serve two purposes get rid of a mission card, and also block one of your opponent's attacks. Eno's dad, another really obvious choice. You might think it's weird to throw him in without Shikaku and Choza, but honestly, he doesn't need it. Uh, he's a 4-3 and a 0-3 when he's injured, so not only can he take a damage and not have any hits to his combat stats whatsoever, but he's also Earth, which meant he could be used to power up Caged Bird, or he could be sent to the Chakra for any number of things. He's just a much better version of Kuranai. That's it. Kakashi, of course, stopped your opponent from stalling. If they really tried to just chump block you every time, you would get battle rewards anyway, so it really sped up the game. 
God himself, obviously, and if you don't believe in God, he'll make you a believer. Chidori, not only can Sasuke use it for free, but he can also use it without having it be free by just paying its cost, which is extremely reasonable for what it does. Not only that, but Kakashi can also use it, so at any point in the game, this is a pretty good card. Sharingan I really like the only hope you have against Chidori, <laughs> so uh, you really just ran Sharingan I to get rid of Chidori's and that's it. This ended up beating out 8 Trigram because 8 Trigram needed two specific fires, which was making it very difficult to play in a metagame that was so centered around Earth. And it also came out a bit too late because a Jonin had to use it. Sharingan I was a great counter to all of the Jutsus that were being cast earlier in the game. Headhunter was surprisingly common at this point. And a lot of people might think of it as sort of a random choice, but remember, there was so much earth flying around at this point that uh, you needed something to spend the earth chakra on. Headhunter got rid of your opponent's entire back line, which made it a very, very useful and powerful jutsu, and I don't think a lot of people remember just how good it was. Have you noticed that most mental power ninjas are backline ninjas? Exactly. You get rid of them with Headhunter Jutsu, and you can completely waste out their effects. If your opponent comes in and tries to start a mental power battle with Shikamaru's effect, you send Shikamaru away. You're still in a mental power battle, but you can potentially win and waste Shikamaru's effect. So your opponent loses two cards from their hand, loses their best mental power ninja, and you're probably going to win that battle. Also, if you have a team of three and your opponent has a team of three and you get rid of two of your opponent's ninjas, you're probably winning in power two. Extremely powerful, extremely underrated. Three caged birds, do I even have to explain why? Two exhaustion of stamina. This might also seem like a pretty random card if you didn't fully understand what was going on in the metagame back then, but uh, let's look over what exhaustion of stamina does. Both players get rid of all of their chakra. But Kudokun, what possible advantage could you be at if you get rid of all of your chakra? Well, let's say, hypothetically, Bandai, for some reason, thinks it's a good idea to release a Jutsu card that doesn't have a chakra cost. Let's also say, hypothetically, of course, that the only real answer to this card is a Jutsu card. If a situation like that were to arise, uh, it, it, would, uh, it would seem a little bit unfair. And that's what it did. Exhaustion of Stamina said, guess what? It's my turn, you don't get to respond. I'm going to attack with all my teams, you don't have any chakra to respond to me with, it's GG, my dude. The End of the Mortal Kombat was a card you really only needed one of, because uh, it really just had one specific use. At this point in the game, Brokage was the highest entrance cost ninja that you had, so... Honestly, if your opponent played a Brokage and you didn't really have an answer to it, the best way to get rid of it would just be to, to drop an end of the Mortal Kombat, and your opponent has to sacrifice the Brokage, because at this point, nobody's really running anything at an equal to or higher entrance cost. You, on the other hand, sacrifice something weaker, but if you do this before you play your ninja for the turn, then you could potentially play your own Brokage and be up one Brokage on your opponent. Inherits and entrusts the will, I shouldn't even have to explain this really. Uh, who wouldn't want something that plus sixes in their deck that's just absolutely ridiculous? The only thing that I might have to explain is why you only run one instead of like two. And the reason being, if you're doing this in conjunction with Cop Naruto, you're going to end up getting rid of a lot of cards in your deck, and you don't want to accidentally deck yourself out. Some people did run more than one of this because of Cop Naruto's effect, because if you ended up discarding this and your opponent still had one in their deck, they'd be able to just plus six on you and then style on you. But most people just kept it to one and then said, oh well, if they happen to not get it. And finally, this client was a really great fit for the deck. Uh, came out on turn 2, and if you were able to get 3 battle rewards in one turn, you dealt 1 damage to one of your opponent's ninjas. So, if you were going out with 3 teams, for example, and your opponent was just going to let all of them through, then that could end up biting them later, because you just dealt a damage to a ninja, either rendering one ninja incapacitated and with a much weaker stat line, or you could use it to obviously uh, just kill an injured ninja off. Not to mention the synergy with its two elements. Honestly, if your deck is going to have a client, this is probably the best you're going to do. 
Now that we've discussed that, let's scale it back for a second and talk about the other things going on in the metagame at the time. A lot of you are probably foaming at the mouth right now because I've gone 30 minutes into a discussion on R&R without talking about turn 5 Kabuto. Listen, you and I, we need to sit down and have a talk with each other. I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, as amazing as Kabuto was, he was never actually that good in this metagame. He was a highly sought after card because of his potential, not necessarily because he's just a metagame breaking card, he's just a potentially really good card. For those of you that don't know, uh, Culvert could essentially just dodge all jutsu, which made him really great because he could use his own jutsu without fear of any repercussions. If your opponent wants to water vortex, they can't because uh, that would require targeting Kabuto, which means they just can't use it at all. He can't be 8 trigrams, which is pretty awesome, again. He can't be targeted with Headhunter Jutsu, which, again, is pretty awesome. 3 support means he has a decent stat line. Honestly, this is a really good card, but the problem is it's a very balanced card. Do you see where I'm going with this? It's a very balanced card in a metagame where everything else is horribly imbalanced. Also take a good, long, hard look at his effect text. Does it say anywhere that he dodges the Brokage's effect? Okay, so I'm thinking I'm gonna maybe, possibly, sort of, consider maybe using like a, uh, like a, a water vortex? Genma, name misspelled, was often a pretty interesting choice for getting your one dude out of the deck. So you could play him, get your client out, and that was it. And later on in the game, he would serve a bit of a better purpose. So for right now, he's just a fun gimmick, but keep him in mind for later. Another tracker essentially gives you two deploys in one turn, which is always nice. As long as you had a Sasuke or a Kakashi in play, you could use High Speed Body to cycle one card out of your hand at the beginning of every turn. And Reaper Death Seal was an interesting choice that a lot of people tacked into their deck, because keep in mind what I said before about information. So you could play Reaper Death Seal to search your opponent's deck and see exactly what they have left. So you could see every single card in your opponent's deck, and you were declaring one card to get rid of them from their deck. This honestly should have been a 3 of in like every deck, but the only problem with it is it's so specific on who can play it, and it cannot come out until turn 6. So if you are playing around the third Hokage and you do want to use this, some people were taking it in at 1, but it wasn't a very common thing to see. The meta was so obvious at this point in the game that you would be forgiven for thinking nothing else was going on. But I am happy to announce that the other elements and archetypes were finding a way to stay relevant through the use of a new system called packets. A packet is a small set of cards you could put in your deck to make one strategy viable within your deck regardless of what kind of deck you ran. In layman's terms, it was coming out near the end of the set that you didn't necessarily have to run a pure fire deck or a pure fire mental deck, but you could run any strategy you wanted and make it competitively viable by just including this packet of 10 cards. Your deck would then have a splash of fire in it, and it would be able to answer a lot of the things that were in the metagame. It still wouldn't be as good as a fire earth mental, but it would at least come close. Other packets were starting to form at the time, and people were making packets around appearance of unknown rivals in water, uh, they were making packets around mental power, they were making packets around everything, and they were just extremely easy sets of cards you could just shove into a deck to make it get a different strategy of some kind. The strategy in the fire packet, of course, being standing a chance and winning a match once or twice. I'm also guessing that somebody was a bit upset about how Byakugan went last time, so they ended up making new Hyuga support that really heavily outshadows the old Hyuga stuff. So if Hyugas were your thing, they definitely stepped up their game here. Hizashi was a turn 4-5-0 that could off himself during your opponent's battle phase to stop them from getting any battle rewards. You could use Reason for their highest renown with Hizashi to injure everybody on your opponent's side of the board, which is pretty fun. 
Curse Mark Jutsu was the setup for a combo. It was a free Jutsu, so you could charge it as Chakra right afterwards, and you get to put one coin on one of your opponent's ninjas. Keep in mind, it doesn't have to be a ninja battling against you, so if your opponent decides not to block this ninja's team, or if they block but you just want to hit somebody else, you could just easily mark them. Then you would just use Secret Mark of the Main Branch to injure them and also make your opponent discard a bunch of cards from their hand. Incredibly sluggish, but very nice payoff if you played it correctly. Ain't Trigram's Rotation, which was unironically used pretty often, because it made it so nobody in your team could receive any damage. So if your opponent did happen to drop that mad free Dory, you could just use a Trigram Palms rotation and nobody was taking any damage. It also meant that Neji by himself could tank a team because you could send Neji out, have him block, use this, nothing happens. That's it. The real hype was around eight Trigram 64 Palms. And uh, I mean, it's really bad, but it's also kind of cool at the same time, so we can talk about it. You pick a ninja, you flip a coin, and if it's heads, you not only give that ninja one damage, but you repeat this effect with another target. So, hypothetically, you could like wipe an entire team for two chakra, which is cool, but you could also just end up spinning two chakra on absolutely nothing. I think they overtuned this card. What the effect should have done was just give one damage to one ninja battling against the user, and then you could flip a coin to continue giving damage. The fact that you don't get any damage if your first coin comes up tails makes this card unplayable. But if all you want is a flavorable Hyuga deck, then, I mean, you need them. It's just too much flavor to not use. Earth was also pushing this Inoshika Cho idea of using the dads, and uh, they're okay because they get really powerful if you can get all three of them out at once, but the problem with the old guy Inoshika Cho is they're all turn 4 ninjas. So turn 4 you drop Shikaku, turn 5 you drop Chozo, turn 6 you drop Inoichi. That's cute, and they are a really powerful team, but by that point your opponent's probably already got their win condition on board. It's just too much to try and get ready starting on turn 4. They did get some pretty decent jutsu though. Shadow Strangle made a ninja 0 0, and if their support was less than or equal to Shikaku's, then they took a damage. It's pretty nice. Mind Destruction made it so one of your opponent's ninjas would add their power to your team instead of their team, which was hilarious if your opponent did happen to drop a Chidori, because that meant even though their ninja gets the plus 5 bonus from Chidori, that power goes into your team. So like if a Kakashi uses it to go up to being a 10, then that 10 power gets added to you, not them. At this point people were also trying to find a way to abuse Secret Wood style Jutsu, Deep Forest Creation, that straight out just said your opponent skips their next turn. Obviously devastating. Obviously. And what makes this really interesting is uh, if your opponent skips their turn, their turn marker doesn't go up, so you could technically play a turn marker above your opponent, which at this point in the game doesn't matter too much, but it was something interesting to keep in mind that people would try to play around a bit later. The only reason people didn't play around with this more and try and make it a serious deck idea is because at this point in the game, the only first Hokage we have is actually a water ninja because he's under Orochimaru's control. Hidden Capacity is something that got played around with. Um, unfortunately, it has a pretty big glaring problem that we'll look at here in a second. So essentially, you give it to a ninja and that ninja's mental power becomes zero, but over the course of a few turns, it gets plus one mental power after every turn that passes. Now, this would be great if it just said one ninja, because you could technically use this on one of your opponent's ninjas and get rid of their mental power to make it easier to win mental power battles or to take away their mental power battles. But the fact that it has to be one of your ninja just makes it way too slow to use as a way to actually build your mental power. One fun thing about it though is if you use it on that Naruto that has negative one mental power, it technically makes him smarter. I don't even know how to respond to that. The Sound 4 came out in this set, and you can imagine that me being a water purist did try to play with the Sound 4 as much as possible. They all had pretty much the same effect. You could take all four of the Sound 4 and put them in one team, and that team of ninja cannot be the target of your opponent's jutsu cards. Toyuya was really the best of this team because uh, she had three support in both healthy and injured, making her technically even better than Inoichi, but the reason, of course, she wasn't used is because she's water and Inoichi is earth. 
we got a new Orochimaru as well. Uh, if he ever dies, then you could just sacrifice a ninja to put him back in your hand, which was kind of sort of bad because that meant you were going minus just to bring Orochimaru back. I mean, technically it's fine because you could just sacrifice a ninja that you don't need anymore, but eh, it would be better if he just came back into play. Um, the fact that he didn't, though, is just just made him really, really bad for the time. I mean, people still ran him because it's Orochimaru, and he's a 6-4, which is a really nice stat line, but he just wasn't that good. Like I said before, the first and second Hokage saw their debut in this set, and they were both Water Ninja because they were under the control of Orochimaru, so they wanted to put them both in the same deck as Orochimaru. Both of their effects let them pay one less for Jutsu in their respective elements, the first Hokage being Earth and the second being Water, and so you could use the second Hokage to play all of your Water Jutsu for one less. Um, two cost a Water Vortex was pretty awesome. You also had one cost Water Prison. The possibilities were really endless. That two mental power and that four support certainly help as well. I'd say their main problem is just being entrance cost six ninjas along with Orochimaru. It meant if you wanted to run all three of them in the same deck, chances are they weren't coming out for quite a while. Medical ninjas were starting to do something, mainly Kabuto. Uh, you could pay X amount of chakra to just heal X amount of ninjas on your side of the field. Very useful after a Tide of the Deadly Combat. And since it's a Jutsu card, your opponent can't really respond to it until they know you're playing it. Impenetrable Barrier was something you always ran along the Sound 4, because you could take one Jutsu being played and just yeet it back on top of the deck, meaning not only was your opponent not drawing any new cards, but they were also getting their Jutsu knocked away every time they tried to play it, and if you had all four of the Sound 4 in play, then this kept going back to your hand. So essentially, your opponent just didn't get to play Jutsus anymore. Summoning Jutsu Reanimation, nobody ever did anything with this, but I always thought it was really cool. Essentially, you just paid 3 Chakra to swap one of your current ninjas in your team out with a ninja in your discard pile, which was pretty cool. Let's remember that Brokage discarded himself after using his effect. So if you had a Brokage in your discard pile, and you had Summoning Jutsu Reanimation, you could just swap one of your ninjas out with Brokage, and then use Brokage's effect. It's pretty nice. Speaking of Water and Brokage, something I want to talk about with Water and the third Hokage is that I came up with a tech that I never actually got to play because obviously at the time I was never going to be able to afford a set of Brokages. Are you kidding me? They were going for like 60 to 80 dollars at the time. So what I'm about to talk about was never a part of the metagame, but if I were a bigger part of the metagame and also not like 12, I really, really wanted to bust in with this idea that I'm about to uh, present to you guys. So, if you take Brokage and use this effect, then you could also use Twin Snake Sacrifice to destroy a second ninja, since your Brokage is going to die anyways. So, you could essentially just use Twin Snake Sacrifice to make your Brokage discard double the ninjas with his effect. I thought that was really cool, so I thought I'd share it with you. And again, had I been a bigger part of the metagame, this is the main strategy that I would have based my entire deck around. Lightning's role in the metagame fell very hard, but I still to this day hold that Lightning could have been a much, much bigger contender in the metagame had we actually found some new stuff. Jiraiya and the fourth Hokage were absolute monsters. Um, they had summoning jutsu before anybody else did. It could have done something, and here are some of the cards that got released in the fourth set that could have made them a lot better. Well, not this one. This one sucks. Yes, in the fourth set we got the release of the Nine-Tailed Fox Spirit, and he is terrible really bad. He's mainly just a collector piece, you know, if you're trying to collect the Naruto cards and you're not really playing the game, you wanted a Nine-Tailed Fox Spirit because it's so cool. His effect is when he comes into play, your opponent gets two battle rewards. Now, let's look at why this is horrible. He's a turn nine ninja, so ten turns have gone by by the time you actually get this guy in play because you have to count turn zero. He is a 9999, yes, he is the most powerful ninja that the game will ever see. No other ninja will ever have more than 9 power in any of their stats, meaning that up until the end of Naruto's existence, this was the most powerful ninja in the game. But... 
he doesn't have any form of protection, so you could still easily use a jutsu to just step over him or bro kage him out of existence. So your opponent gets two battle rewards and then uses a jutsu to just disappear him out of existence and then they win. That's that's really what he does. Something that's easily forgotten is this is the first set that we saw platooning. Platooning confused a lot of people when it came out, but let me explain it very simply. So if you have one of these two ninjas in play, you can get rid of that one ninja to put this in its place. It's essentially like an upgrade or an evolution for that character, as long as you don't already have the other one in play. So if you have both Kakashi and Might Guy in play, you can't play this. But if you have one Kakashi or one Might Guy in play, then you can play it. The reason that I'm including this in Lightning when it's a Lightning Fire is because most Fire decks just didn't bother running it uh, because the other Kakashi's effect was so good. But Lightning decks would use this as a way to power up their Might Guy and also get access to Sharingan Eye from Kakashi. When this ninja blocks, it gets plus one, plus one, making it an 8 4 extremely good stat line at level 5, man. If you had Might Guy and you could immediately platoon him out for this, you had a monster on your hands. But oddly enough, that's not why this card is good. Best Rival is the most unappreciated card in the entire set, bar none, hands down. If you have both Kakashi and Might Guy in the same team, then every time they battle, whether it's an attack or a block, they get an outstanding victory regardless of the results. So if it's a mental power, they still win. If it's just, you know, them versus every other ninja in the entire game, they still win. And keep in mind, it's not just a regular victory, it's an outstanding victory. So every single time your opponent blocks against this team or attacks and you block with this team, then uh, their head ninja is getting sent to the discard pile and both of their back ninjas are going to be injured. The balancer to this card, of course, was you had to get both Kakashi and Might Guy out on the field in order to pull off this effect. However, the platoon counts as both Kakashi and Might Guy. So if you could platoon into Kakashi Might Guy and then play Best Rival right afterwards, for two turns, your opponent couldn't play the game. <laughs> Every time you attack, your opponent has to give you the battle rewards or meet Puppet and Ninja off. And every time your opponent tries to attack, of course, uh, uh, that is a dead team. They cannot attack for two turns or you'll just kill whatever they send to attack. Pledge of Victory let you get a bunch of Chakra. This was a really great answer to your opponent playing Exhaustion of Stamina because uh, you could just send three teams to attack and when you do, you get three Chakra. And it was just a really great way to supercharge your chakra area, which is important for a card we're about to look at. Naruto 2K Barrage was one of the best gambling cards in the game because things were tipped in your favor at all times. You can pay any number of chakra you want to and then reveal the top cards of your deck that many times. For every ninja that you see, you can pick one ninja and just give them all of the damage. So you could potentially give one ninja two damage by just paying two chakra. What made this better is you could just look in your discard pile in your hands to see how many non-ninja cards you've gotten and then sort of predict how many ninjas would be in your deck. And then you could use that prediction to figure out how much chakra you want to pay. If you really wanted to, you could just go crazy and pay like 5 chakra to guarantee that a ninja was going to die. It was also great because uh, a really popular... A player at the time named J Dragon used to sign people's cards, and I remember somebody uh, actually showed him signing this card. It said J Dragon Barrage. Super good. Sorry, I I'm reliving some old memories. But yeah, honestly, this was a really great kill move for Naruto, and since it only targeted one ninja and not one ninja battling against the user, you could use it if you're not blocked, and you could use it on a ninja that didn't block you. Uh, Shadow Clone Jutsu was a gimmick. It saw very very, very limited play, but it saw play nonetheless. You could stack up a bunch of your ninjas with uh, really high combat, and then instead of applying their support values, they apply their combat values when adding up damage. This meant that you could potentially have the most powerful team in the game because uh, you were just getting so much from your combat instead of your support. But, uh, again, it's a gimmick. It's a really, really dumb gimmick, and I have no idea how it saw so much play. Finally, let's talk about wins. I feel really bad, because wins didn't really 
get to play in Revenge and Rebirth. At this point, even Lightning is outpacing them, and, I mean, a lot of people used wind cards, like, they had the best draw engines in the game, and of course, Tumtem is just an extremely good one-drop, but, I mean, it's sort of an always the bridesmaid, never the bride sort of thing, you know? They're just not good enough to build an entire deck around at this point. People just used him either for flavor or for splash. As you can imagine, this card was pretty good. Uh, stopping your opponent from just using jutsu cards on one of their ninjas was always a really good thing, especially if your opponent was using a Sasuke or a Kakashi. If for some reason you were playing puppets at this time, uh, Armed Puppet was a really great card, because you could put a poison counter on one of your opponent's ninjas, and that ninja cannot go out to battle. Meaning, if you're the blocker, and you place a poison counter on one of your opponent's full teams of ninja, then on your turn, that ninja's team cannot go out to battle, so they are a sitting duck. In fact, the only thing that's bad about this card is, of course, the fact that you would have to play puppets. Change in pairings is the best thing that Wind got in this set, and it's a much, much more effective version of Armed Puppet, because you could just choose one of your opponent's ninja, and that ninja cannot be sent out to battle. Granted, Armed Puppet lasts forever, and this only lasts one turn, but most of the time you really only needed this to be in play one turn to do whatever you were trying to do. And that's kind of it. Uh, what can I really say about Revenge and Rebirth that hasn't already been said? It was a turning point that defined the rest of the game. There are still people to this day on YouTube buying up boxes of this set and doing pack openings on YouTube. I know a lot of people hate how stale it felt, but I still to this day hold it up as being the most influential set in the game, and also one of the most sets to play through. Because, like I said before, as stale as you might think it is, you really, really had to be good at the game to succeed in this metagame. There was no gimmick that was going to save you, it's not a matter of one deck just being a counter to another deck and there being some kind of rock, paper, scissors mechanic. There is one clear way to play the game, and you either adapt and get really good at playing the game, or you don't. And it's not like you're playing in some weird gimmicky way, you're actually just playing with all of the cards that are counters to each other, and so you need a high level of skill to know exactly how the deck works and how you're supposed to play. And of course you can't forget that a lot of people didn't just play a cookie cutter version of the deck, they would all make different versions of the deck, and you could really see players' creativity in what they chose to tech in and what they chose to take out. But anyways, this video is nearly an hour long, and if you enjoyed it, I really appreciate you sticking with it for so long. If you enjoyed it, of course, leave it a like. Those things really do help me out. Leave me your thoughts on the set and anything else you want to see in the comment section below. And finally, subscribe to stay up to date on the latest Kudo news. I had a pretty rough time recording the end of this video, so if you want to make me laugh and also prove that you made it to the end of the video, leave an anime-related joke in the comment section below. Thank you all so much for the support. Hopefully, it's not another five months before you see another one of these things. But for right now, that's all I got. Catch you later.